Welcome to part two of this mini series all about roe deer and this video is all about getting closer to the deer and photographing them. I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that and then at the end of the video I'm just going to discuss a little bit more uh, about how my ideas have changed and what I'm looking to do moving forward. So what is the best way to get close to roe deer to photograph them? Well, I think there's two main ways of doing it, which are totally opposite of each other. So the first one is simply to find yourself a spot, uh, just plonk yourself there and just wait it out. The way that's gonna work the best is if you know a bit about the roe deer and a little bit about their habits and where they're likely to be. So what I'd suggest is you wanna be by the field edges because you're already gonna have some cover. But if you can find an area, literally like where I am now actually, uh, where two, three or even four fields kind of come together near those corners, then as well as the surrounding cover, I think it's gonna give you more opportunities. And if it's by walkways as well, near tracks that you know that they use, and that's gonna increase your chances. So you could either be uh, sitting down, get yourself a stool maybe, or you could be standing up. You're probably gonna need a tripod for this ideally, so you don't have to keep using the camera, holding the camera. I would try and make use of any available cover that's already there. So you could use a hide. I don't really think a hide is, is ideal for road deer photography, but just look for anything natural that can help uh, cover you to break up your outline. Uh, for example, it might be as simple as a, as a gate or maybe a straw bale. They're absolutely fantastic. Or maybe some farm machinery. Um, as well as breaking up your outline, it's also something that the deer are used to. So the thing with road deer particularly, they get very, very used to their environment. That they they walk through every single day. They get used to what they see and anything they see out of the ordinary, I think they become suspicious. So if you can use something that's already there naturally, I think it's just gonna to help to put them at ease. The advantage of staying in one place is that you're less likely to disturb the deer. Uh, they're not gonna see you coming. The disadvantage is that there could be something going on, which is really, really fantastic, amazing photo opportunities. And because you're hunkered down in that one place, you just never get to see any of it. The other technique is stalking, I guess you could call it, is trying to get closer to the deer, uh, unseen, uh, not disturb them and get close enough for photographs. Uh, the advantage of this is, there's a few advantages actually. One is that you can actually move yourself depending on the wind position. So if you need to uh, put yourself in a better position to stay downwind, you can do that. If you're in one place, you never know if there's a deer behind you, for example. Uh, the other advantage is that you're more likely to find the deer, as long as you're good at tracking them, a bit of local knowledge, you're more likely to find the deer and get some photo opportunities as opposed to being in one place. The disadvantage, of course, is uh, that unless you're very, very good at it, they are more likely to see you come in and hear you come in as well. So two different ways of doing it. Both have worked for me and both have not worked for me. If you're trying to stalk roe deer, then you need to move incredibly slowly. That's the most important thing because they're so good at picking up movement. Also, you want to be really careful with any sound you're making. So uh, as well as just moving slowly to keep the sound to a minimum, check the ground as you're walking for any twigs or leaves, anything that can crackle or crack like some kind of cereal, um, that's likely to alert them. So really important to keep checking the ground to make sure you're not gonna suddenly stand on something that's gonna alert them. And again, in terms of the, the wind position, you wanna make sure you try and stay as downwind as you can all the time. When I'm stalking, I like to have my little field binoculars with me as well. I've learned this is definitely a valuable thing to do. Um, roe deer are relatively large to photograph, but they're still amazingly good at disappearing into the landscape into their habitat uh, sometimes they could be like on the other side of a hedgerow for example and with the naked eye sometimes you can't make them out um, so as I'm getting closer to to a certain area I'll have a look with the binoculars and then I'll know for sure if anything's there or not and then I can adjust my approach and uh, to make life easier if I just had the binoculars around my neck they swing around like crazy and that would be really annoying and potentially cause more disturbance it's just raining on me now for some reason. Uh, so what I actually do is kind of, I keep them around my back 
and then I just pull them round up to my eyes as need be and then put them back again. In terms of camera equipment, the quieter the better. So if you're using a mirrorless camera then you're at a massive advantage. Uh, one of the things that the Rode is going to react to is the sound of a shutter. If it's very loud then that might be a problem. Uh, if you're using a non-mirrorless camera like I still am, then uh, try and muffle it. So this is my technique. Uh, the moment is balaclava just muffle and I've got this cover as well which is more a rain cover but it all, just, it all just helps to muffle the camera a little bit and if the camera is making any kind of noise then I would try and just shoot one frame at a time or in short bursts if it's just a portrait uh, then I often just shoot one shot a uh, single shot to keep the noise down if it's moving then obviously you want to take take more shots but try and do it in just short bursts don't keep going for a high continuous frame rate rattling off loads of frames you want to take a few shots watch for any reaction of the deer and if the deer looks comfortable then you can take a few more the noise of the images is really important as well so you're going to be shooting quite a lot um, likely earlier late in the day often in low light levels so the better your the better your camera is on ISO for noise capability uh, the better images you're gonna get I definitely prefer the handheld approach for road air photography that's what I always do uh, I just think a tripod is really impractical you it's gonna get in the way it's gonna drag on things um, you're gonna have to adjust the height of it as well and a 300 or 400 millimeter you know might be enough in some situations for road air if you are using a much longer lens then it probably is going to be a tripod job and just staying a little bit further back. Clothing is definitely a consideration for sure, uh, but ha perhaps it's not quite as important as some people think it is for deer photography. Uh, I would just start off with the usual greens and browns that you probably wear for wildlife photography just to blend in better into the landscape. And then I usually have my green hat and my light green gloves. Uh, they help break my outline up a bit more. But also, I often just need them because shooting early or late in the day for roe deer, uh, I probably want to wear them anyway uh, just to keep warm. Now you can go down the route as well of adding more camouflage. So I have had some success getting close to road deer with the camouflage hood to cover the, the whites of my face and I guess my glasses as well. Now my feeling is that these things can help you get closer to the deer. So from a distance, they're probably gonna help you if you're stalking to get close. Uh, they're probably gonna help you if you're in one place not to be seen. The problem with that is that I think there comes a point uh, that when the deer does get very, very close that no matter how well camouflaged you are, uh, the likelihood is it will figure out that you're there and then there's more chance of spooking it. So you could even go full on Yeti uh, with your, your ghillie suit and that is fantastic camouflage, don't get me wrong, I think it's absolutely fantastic camouflage. Um, I love how it looks, I'm not a massive fan. But again, once the deer gets very, very close, uh, there's a good chance it's gonna, it's gonna figure you out. I have kind of changed my approach to photographing road deer, uh, particularly this year. So I'm much more cautious now about disturbing them in any way. And obviously I never wanted to disturb them, it's the last thing I want to do. But there has been occasions in the past where they've seen me come in or I've been in one place and they've spotted me and it's definitely spooked them. Uh, sometimes like the books for example, they do, this, um, they do this alarm call where they kind of bark at you, it's basically like a bark. Uh, and you know that you've alarmed them and they sense danger. Um, I think if that happens occasionally, I don't think it's gonna be uh, the end of the world and we certainly don't wanna do it deliberately. Um, but if you keep doing that and keep disturbing them repeatedly, because they are such regular creatures, they're so often in the same places at the same times, what can potentially happen is they start to associate that area with danger. And that's just the worst thing that could happen because that means they're gonna change their habits. You know, they're gonna change their habits completely of, of where they go, where they feed. It might mean that they move to worse feeding grounds, for example, which is not good for them. So the less you can disturb them, the better. They're also gonna become, um, they're gonna associate you with danger. So the way you look, maybe the clothes you wear, if you wear the same clothes, clothes, uh, the way you move, uh, your smell as well, they're going to associate that with danger if you keep disturbing them. So it's not going to be good all around. So I do really, really try my best. Any encounters I have with roe deer, whether I get pictures or not, um, I want them to be completely relaxed 
and to, to leave as happy as they were when they first arrived. I've recently been reading a fantastic resource about deer.com which is by Mark Nicolay's website. He's also produced a book, A Year in the Life of a Roe Deer, with a foreword by Laurie Campbell with some amazing images. I haven't got the book but I really should, uh, but I can tell there's some amazing images in there. And that's made me think more about the best way to approach the deer. And his approach is one that I'm favouring more. Uh, his argument is that the, the senses of the roe deer are so absolutely amazing, which they are, that you shouldn't really try to beat it. It's probably a better idea to get to a certain distance from the animals and then kind of let them know that you're there. Uh, so one of the interesting things again is with the sight, that if you're just stood very, very still wearing dull clothes, if you're stood in front of a hedgerow for example, then they'll probably look up and they'll probably see something, but they don't see in the same way we do. And um, if you're not moving and if you're not threatening, then you know there's a good chance that they'll accept you. And that's probably a better way. So it might be a better option to use a very careful approach to put yourself roughly in an area closer to the deer and then kind of let them come to you. Over the next few months I'm going to be trying some of these techniques and seeing how they work and hopefully I can put that into some videos and give you some updates. Uh, do check out that website and if you get a chance to buy the book uh, it looks absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.